as I was, I had my message. I told Tammy, and I was sitting down a couple of days ago and just praising and worshiping the Lord. And I said, Lord, if, and I said to him all the time, Lord, if you want to change my message, you're free to do so. You know, I don't want my message, I want yours. And at that moment, I felt the presence of God in such a way that it kind of surprised me. And I saw the message in front of me, and it was not my message. Wow. It was his. And I just began to weep as he began to show me what he wanted you to hear. And so there, there's got to be a reason you're here. Amen. And there's got to be a reason he's picked that certain message for somebody. And, and, and so I just want to read the scripture. You know the scripture. You're very familiar with it. If you ever read your Bible, you know it. That's for sure. <laughs> and it, I'll read it to you from the King James. And it's Jeremiah 29, 11 through the 13th verse. It says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word, not mine. I thank you that your word does not return back void, but it accomplished and established that that you set it out to do. I thank you, Lord, that your presence is in this place. And I thank you for people who have decided, maybe out of curiosity, maybe someone said, just let's go. And, but it doesn't matter what their reasoning is. The matter is they're here, not because of me, because they need oh. to hear a word from God. Yes. They need to hear a word from God. I said they need to hear a word from God that will change them and transition them into the very thing you're trying to do within them, Lord. And so, Lord, here am I. I ask for the anointing to break and destroy yokes. I ask for the anointing to convict and to open up our eyes in the spiritual realm so that we can see and understand what you want us to know and what we can carry with us, Lord. Not just a good message, but a due message oh. for who you have in store for us. In Jesus' name. How many of you here consider yourself mature Christians? Raise your hand. Okay, only three. <laughs> That's good. That's okay. I don't know if they ever get there. Okay. I probably shouldn't have started that. I ask, you know, as I'm ministering the word, some of it is, you know, to think on. Okay, if you have anything to say, I'm not saying what I did ask you, so I did want an answer. But if you got any comments, anything you want to say to me, please hold it to the very end so we don't, I don't quench the Spirit of God. Okay, so I'd appreciate that. I want to start out sharing a visual story called a parable. I got a story. One day there was a guy and he was walking down this path and he saw this gigantic coal pit and he looked at it and it was huge and he said, hmm, I think I'll go to the side of it and go around it. And so he went like this, and guess what? He fell in the pit. <laughs> Wild pass. He went down that same path. Sure enough, that pit was still there. And so he thought to himself, hmm, I'll go this way. I'm, I'm just going to go around this pit. And he fell into the pit again. Couple of wild had passed. He walked down that same path, and there was that pit. And he thought to himself, hmm, if I go that way, I'll fall in. If I go that way, I'll fall in. So he backed up and he took a 
jumped, <laughs> uh, leaping over, and guess what? Oh. He fell. <laughs> <laughs> While had passed, and he was walking down that same path, and he saw that pit. And he thought to himself, I went this way, I went that way, I went this way. And guess what he did? Jumped in. I went backwards. He took a different path. <laughs> and so what I want to say to you today is, you know, the scripture, insanity or lunacy, means doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different result, right? And so, what changed? Did, what, did the pit change? What changed? He did. He had to move. He had to go a different path. He had to go a different direction or else he would have fell right back in the same pit he just got out of. Right? And, and, and so, I want to say to you today that it's not unusual to fall into a pit. Many people have fallen over again and again in the same pit. What, what kind of pit, Pastor? Well, I'm glad you asked that. A pit of despair, a pit of hopelessness, a pit of fear, a pit of discouragement, a pit of fear. We've all been there. We've all been in that pit and one person said he didn't. You're a liar. Amen. <laughs> We've been in that pit. And, and sometimes people wait for someone to jump in with them so they don't feel alone. And other times they wait for someone to pray them out of that pit. And that's okay up to a certain point. But if you're in the pit more than you're outside the pit, something is wrong. Something is wrong. As the Lord had given me this message, the title of it is Transitioning in the Midst of Turmoil. Let, let me say that again in case you're writing it down. It's Transitioning in the Midst of Turmoil. What is turmoil? We, we can think of a lot of things. I looked it up in the Cambridge English Dictionary. It's a state of confusion, uncertainty, or disorder. Confusion when we're confused because we don't understand what's going on. We don't understand the why. That's why we're confused. Uncertainty, we're uncertain because we don't know the outcome. We, we, we are no longer in control. Disorder, because it disrupts our peace and our joy. Especially in the times we're living in now. Turmoil can be anything in our lives. It can be a failed marriage. It can be a lost loved one. It can be the loss of a spouse. It can be a health issue. It can be a ministry that just isn't going anywhere. It can be doors closing one by one in our life. Anything can become a turmoil in our eyes, in our lives, I should say, that causes us to be confused, that cause us to question why. You're still with me, you guys are getting yes. quiet out here. Yes. We know that this nation is in turmoil right now. So is the whole world, for that matter. Unless you live off the grid. I would love to live off the grid. But we're not there. But this message is not to the nations. It's for you. God's loving people has chosen people. Well, it's everyone that outside this house, but they're not here. You are. And this is what the Lord is saying. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, the first verse. That's Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, the first verse. I'll read it to you in the King James. Now these are the words of the letter 
that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders which were carried away captives, and to the priests, and to the prophets, and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. These are those that Nebuchadnezzar, if you know your history, carried away and displaced somewhere else. Is God's chosen people. Why? Why? We know why. Judgment had come. And Jeremiah, let me say, he is known as the weeping prophet. He wept all the time. He wept at the condition and the state of God's people. He wept because he tried to explain to them that God is going to bring judgment if we do not repent and turn from our idols and seek him. And sometimes the king would take what he read and just rip it up and laugh at him and then put him in prison. And as soon as he got out, he continued to say what God put in his heart to say. He continued to warn them on their state, on their condition. They worship idols. Baal is one that they worship. They sacrifice their offsprings to Moloch in the fire. And they did not believe that judgment was coming to them. They believed that they were God's people and God would never bring judgment upon them. Sounds familiar? And, and, and you know what's interesting is, as I looked it up about Molech, it said that God had mentioned about putting your children in the fire. And he said that if you see a stranger come and he does that with his child, you are to stone that man or that woman. And he said, but if you do nothing about it and you just stand there and allow him to do what he's doing knowing it's wrong, then you shall be separated from your loved ones. You know, when we look at the condition that Israel was in at that time, we cannot but do nothing but shake our head because this nation, there's a lot of wickedness going on. We know there's child pornography. We know that abortions are taking place. Even after the child is born, they want to abort the baby. If that's not Molech, I don't know what yeah. the spirit of Molech. Yeah. We know that not only this is going on, but child sex trade, homosexuality, even in the pulpit. <laughs> Christian riches and warlocks, false prophets, and seeker-friendly churches, just to name a few. God is a God of long-suffering, but he is also a God of judgment. And I believe with all my heart that this nation, even though this nation has sent more missionaries to other countries, and have more so-called Christians here than other nations is under judgment as, long, as well as the world. We can see it. We know it. If you read Revelation, you know that we are living in a day and an age where we need to cry out to God. Yes. You know, when I looked at it, I remember saying to the Lord, because I was reading and listening to every prophet that there was, only to find out that they weren't telling you the truth. And it caused discouragement. And it caused hopelessness. What are you saying? Trump is going to be here in January. Trump is coming in, in, in May. Trump is coming in August. Trump is coming in October. You know, after a while, I said, Lord, what are we going to do? You know what the Lord said to me? He said, why are you looking for a man to deliver this nation instead of Amen. looking at me, oh, the yeah, deliverer? Yeah. Get yeah. your eyes back on me. Yeah. And I repented because I was discouraged. Yes. Number four, you're saying, well, where are we going with this? You'll see. Okay. You will see. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the fourth verse. 
the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. You know, he has carried them away. They're captives. Now, let's look at it out of the natural and come over to the spiritual. What does it mean to be a captive? You can be a captive physically in your body. You can be a captive in affirmities and affliction going on in your body or even a disease. God only knows what afflictions you could have in your body that you are captive to. But you can also be a captive in your mind. Yes. You can have mental illness. You can have uh, fear. Fear is a big one. Fear is rapid in this country. Yes. Yeah. You can be a captive to a lot of things that will carry you back into that pit. That's right. If we go down that path. But, then, but this, is, this is the amazing part. You know, I used to preach on the first part of it, you know, not the first part, the 20, the 11th verse. Because everyone knows the 11th verse. That's such a nice verse. Yes. Isn't it? Yeah. That's the one we say, yes, Lord, yes. But this, I want you to get the fifth verse. To me, every time I read it, just, it just wobbles me. They're captives, why? Because they were disobedient. Why? They didn't believe the report of the Lord because they were his children. Therefore, God is merciful. And he is. But his mercy, he also is a God of justice. And he raised them up to be a nation that others could look to. And they weren't looking up to them because they were doing the same thing like the rest of the nation. Oh. Does anyone get that? Yes. God never called us to blend in. He called us to stand out. And so, you know, what's amazing is even though they were wicked, naughty, naughty, naughty people, because they wouldn't follow the word of the Lord and obey his commandment, God still loves them. God still cares about them. And he says to them in the fifth verse, Build ye houses and dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. Build ye houses, and dwell in them. Plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. In other words, he's saying to them, live where you have been sent as a captain. I want you to live. Yes. To live. Praise God. To live. And not only do I want you to live, but I want you to plant vineyards and garden. And I'm here to tell you, church, we're to plant seeds, too. Right. We're to plant seeds of salvation. We're to plant, eat no matter where you are. God says live, prosper, plant seeds. If this is not the time to do so, when will it be time? Yeah. If this is not the time to go up to someone and say, do you know Jesus? Hallelujah. Do, do you know that there's hope? Do you know the Bible speaks of these times? Mm. But we thought we were going to be raptured already. <laughs> then who's going to tell them the truth? Who's going to tell them about the love of a father if it isn't though that God has allowed to stay and stand? And we're upset. And we're afraid. But he says, I want you to plant gardens. I want you to live. Uh, even in your captivity, I want you to flourish. Don't you dare let the devil knock you down where you can't get back up. He wants you to flourish even in your captivity. But the, the scripture I said was transitioning in the midst of turmoil. So what is God saying? Let me finish this verse, six verse. In the seventh, and I'll tell you. Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters. 
Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters to husband, that they may bear sons and daughters, that they may be increased here and not diminish. Bear children. Bear children. Do you know? Let's look at it again from the spiritual. Because we always look at things from the natural. Once upon a time there was. And that's how we read the Bible. Like it's a historical account that happened then. And yeah, it did happen then. But the word is a lie. There's power in the word of God. And, and so, what does it mean to bear children? Spiritually, you're supposed to be bearing ministries. You're supposed to not quit doing what you're doing, even in this time. Even if they say you got to stop. Go underground if you have to. But you either obey man or you obey God. And sometimes you just got to choose which one you're going to obey. Amen. Bear children, church. Fulfill the vision, the dream that God has put in you. You don't have to put it on hold. You don't have to go in that pit. Some people just jump in the pit. I'm safe down here. They're not doing anything either. You're not doing anything in a pit. Why? Seven verses. And seek the peace of the city, where they have caused you to be carried away captives. And pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. What are you saying? Pray for the peace. Pray for that peace in your home. Pray for that peace on your job. Pray for the peace. Because in that peace you will have peace, the Lord says. Well, you don't know my house. Pray for the peace. You don't know my children. Pray for the peace. You don't know my boss. Pray for the peace of them. Because it is in that peace you will have peace. But instead we just complain. We complain. Find someone to jump in that pit with us, don't we? We'll say, mm -hmm. you think your kids are bad? You haven't seen mine. You know, we, we go into that comparison stage. But God says, pray for the peace so that you can have peace. What is he saying? What he is saying is, I want you to live. I want you to prosper. Or ever, even in the turmoil, even though I plucked you out and I put you where you don't want to be with the people you don't want to be with, doing what you don't want to do, live. Have babies. Be fruitful. Plant trees. So that you don't diminish. But that you prosper. Good. Transitioning in the midst of turmoil. The eighth verse, and thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you. Neither hearken to your dreams which ye caused to be dreamed. In other words, they had false prophets back then. Can you believe that? Yes. <laughs> And they listen to the false prophet. Now, yes, I know a false. A prophet isn't false because they missed it. A prophet isn't false because they didn't get it all right. A prophet is false when they determine that's exactly what they're trying to do, yeah. is deceive you. That's a false prophet. Sometimes prophets overstep their bounds. They, 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 they say what they think God is wanting them to say. And what the word might be right, but the delivery is wrong. Amen. So we cannot despise prophets, but we have to discern it. What does God's word say? A lot of prophets are saying, hey, we're going to get through this okay. And that might happen. I hope to God it does. But what if it don't? What if we're really at the verge of the chip being planted in you? What if you lose your job if you don't get the vaccine? Will you take it? 
But will you trust God? What if I got it? Will you trust God? Will you trust God? Because I have to tell you the truth. Because this is the reality we are in. I can tell you something else. But it won't prepare you for where you're at now. And right now, you need to be strengthened, edified, built up, and know that God loves you. He loves you more than we love ourselves. Even though he sees what's in us, he knows exactly what is in us, and he still loves us. He knows we mess up. He knows we doubt. He knows sometimes we have a hard time trusting because we don't see it. But that doesn't mean God is in it. Look back at your life and see where he's brought you. He did it. Thank you, Jesus. We didn't do it. Some of us could have lost our minds. We may have had it one time, but God restored it. Some of us should have been dead in that car wreck, but somehow God restored us. Amen. Don't you think he's watching over us? Don't he, you think he knows exactly where he is on his timetable? Yes. The ninth verse says, and they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. Let's stop there, 70 years. Wow, I wouldn't be around by then. <laughs> and some of us might not in this room. But what God is saying, 70 years, that's exactly what happened. But it's a new generation. It's a generation longing to go where God wants to take them back to where he promised them. Their land. Yes, Lord. How many want their land? Yeah, I'm ready. And I'm talking about a spiritual land. Yeah. I'm talking about you want what God has promised you. Yes. You, you want it. More than you realize that God wants you to have it. Transitioning in turmoil is hard to do. So why does God do it? He does it because this is where he wants you to know him. This is where you are out of control, but God is not. He wants you to know you are not in control. He wants you to know that he is everything to you. And if it takes going through some steps to get there, that's okay as long as you get there. And don't jump back in the pit. If you get nothing else out of this message, remember, do not go in that pit again. <laughs> what does she preach on? Something about a pit. I'm not getting in it. Yeah, good one. <laughs> 70 years a new generation, not like their parents. This generation will rise up. Amen. Yes. This generation, like the one in the wilderness, they want their king. They want the promises of God. Amen. I want to read this to you in the Amplified. The 11th verse. We read it, but you have to read it in a different content. It's the same message, though. For I know the plans and thoughts that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for peace and well-being, and not for disaster. Anything can be disaster, right? In our life. To give you a future and a hope. He wants to give us a future and a hope. Not the disaster we see. Not the turmoil we're in. He says, I know the plans and the thoughts 
that I have, that I have, that I have for Verse says, when you call on me and you will come and pray to me and I will hear your voice and I will listen to you. You ever felt like God wasn't listening? Like you're, you're hitting a ceiling and, and you're talking but you don't hear him so therefore he can't hear you? But he can. But he can hear you. The 13th verse. And this is the key. This is the key for the 29th, 11th verse. Then with deep longing, you will seek me and require me as a vital necessity. And you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. As a vital necessity. Are we there yet? Some of us might be. Some of us might be. But it's when you come to the point that you thank God because you can breathe that day. When you thank God because, yeah, I might have pain and aches, but I can walk and I can see and I can talk. Hallelujah. You, it's because of you, Lord. It's coming to the place where you realize he is your strength. He is your peace. He is your rock and your hiding place. He is the one who covers you under the shadows of the Almighty God and keeps you when you don't even want to keep yourself anymore. Yeah. When we get to that place, church, where he becomes our vital necessity in everything, not just money, but in everything, he says, he will answer you. He will answer you. I need a healing. I need deliverance. Lord, I need your peace. I need your joy. You're not going to the psychiatrist. You're not going to the pharmacy. You're recognizing these things are working. But God. I need you because you're the only one that can fix my marriage. You're the only one that can heal my broken heart. You're the only one that can bring back my joy and my strength, my vision and my purpose. You're the only one. Nothing else is going to do it. When we recognize he is everything, then When you search for me with all your heart. Why do we have to search for God? Isn't he everywhere? Hmm. Have you ever searched for God? When you come together, you're searching for God. In the midst of a pandemic where you can leave thinking, oh my God, I might get sick. I'm still going to go because I'm searching for answers. And I need the truth and the revelation of who he is in my life. Amen. That's God searching for God. When you open your Bible up and you read it and put aside the TV and the fake news and you read your Bible and you sit there and you Get into the meat of the word. That's searching for God. That's searching for God. I will be found by you, says the Lord. And I will restore your fortune. And I will free you and gather you from all nations and from all places where I've driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place where I've sent you into exile. Now, we know he's talking about the Israelites, but he is also talking about us because we're engrafted in. I will restore everything the devil has stolen from you. I will restore, says the Lord, with the cankerworms and the locusts. I will restore, says the Lord, even your peace and your joy. And I keep saying joy because some of us have lost our joy. 
in the land of captivity. In a place we don't want to be in anymore. Not as a nation, but as what's going on around us. <laughs> this is a Christian song. <laughs> Just so you know, I do not have a cold, and I don't have COVID. I have sinus issues right now. So you don't have to run and move back. So. <laughs> Transitioning in the midst of turmoil. And I said, and I'm closing. This is my last closing. <laughs> that was the last sentence when I did that. I believe there's people here that need the joy of the Lord. I believe there may be people here that need some phys physical healing or an emotional one. That's not mine. <laughs> and so we'd like to minister over you.